So hello everyone and welcome back to Popcorn Jack. Today I'm joined by actor Jack Parr, who stars in two recent 2024 releases, The Last Breath and Take Cover. How are you today, Jack? I'm very well, thank you. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad. It's getting very sort of autumnal, wintry here in the UK. Yeah, but, um, yeah. You know, it's it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. But we, we, our boiler was broken for four months no. and so we just got it fixed yesterday. So I was like, am I having a bath? And I'm putting the heating on full. And so it's on right now. And I'm like, this is great. It's perfect. just perfect time. Life's There's good. a part of me that thought, are we going to have a cold winter? Oh, Could have been. Not again. No, he managed to get, <laughs> we managed to get the plumber around finally. It's all oh, fixed. Life. That's great. Life's good. <laughs> Life's good. <laughs> so people actually may know you, know your face from a few TV show appearances. I did a little dig in, Jack. You've been on the likes of Emmerdale, Peaky Blinders and Masters of Air more recently. Yeah. How was that going from like a soap to like a big budget sort of Apple TV show? What were like the main differences for you? Well, I think everyone knows that like Emmerdale, they're just such a fast turnaround. Mm. Like they film so quick and they're trying to bash out. I don't know how many shows they do a week now, but they it used to be on like five days a week. I think they've gone down to three days a week. So it was just so quick and there's no room for error. So like there was sometimes like... Things go out the window like continuity. Like I, I remember one day we shot, you know, this way and it wasn't raining. And then when we flipped to shoot the other side, it started raining. And I was like, what do we do here? And they were just like, yeah, we just have to film it. Yeah, <laughs> literally, yeah, we cannot yeah. do anything about it. So, that, you know, it's difficult because you, you're learning so much dialogue in such a short space of time. And there's no room to like get it as as good as you want it to be or to perfect things. Whereas on movies and TV shows, there's a lot more of that kind of taking your time and really focusing on um, getting the right shot. Um, and so I've heard, I've got friends who've, who've done shows. Um, I, I think it was Sand, The Sandman on Netflix. And mm. um, they were like, yeah, we, we shoot like one scene a day, which is like <laughs> mental. Like it, they take really take that t- their time. And I was like, wow, that is mad. So whereas like Emmerdale, you're shooting like, um, you know, like maybe like 15 pages of dialogue a day and you're just like this is insane um so yeah it's a big difference um but both really good both good learning curves like brilliant and that's sort of led you now into sort of feature films um which leads nicely on to the first one which is the last breath this came out a little bit earlier this year uh it follows a group of college friends who reunite on a scuba diving trip exploring a world war ii wreckage and of course things start to go wrong and there may be some creatures in the water um so obviously the director Joachim he seems to be familiar with filming underwater on previous projects is that something that sort of reassured you when you signed up to this knowing you could trust this guy yeah 100 percent. and um it was my first lead role so I, when I auditioned I thought wow if I got this oh, obviously you know I'd, I'd do it because it's uh, you know you need to do your first lead at some point um and it's a big deal. Uh, and, you know, a lot of films, they need a named actor to sell the movie and get the finances. So, you know, when I, you know, went up for it, I was like, if I got this, it would be a big deal for me anyway. But they did send um, Joachim's previous film, Breaking Surface, which is in Swedish, dubbed, in, uh, well, subtitled in English. Um, and they sent me that a Vimeo link to watch before the audition. And I watched it because I taped first, then I got a recall and they sent this film. And I watched that and I thought, wow if this guy offers me the job, I am like hundred percent doing this because this guy just knows how to, you know, he's really good with, with tension and, um, and the thrill of the movie and just like keeping that tension and the pacing is really hard with those films. Um, so he, he kept that pacing up so well in that movie. And I just thought, Oh, we are in good hands here. And then I read the script of the last breath and I thought I really liked the script. And then the scuba diving aspect, I was like, what a what an experience, like a lifetime experience. You know, we're going to be scuba diving for 60% of the movie. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you Joachim was a big tick on on the on the thing for me. But again, I'm unknown. So it was like I would <laughs> I would have done it anyway. But um, it was just reassuring to see that team who knew what they were doing. Mm. And so you were like, yeah, yeah, this is this is going to be pretty good. So um, I was excited to jump on board of that for sure. How was the training process for that? Were you practicing in pools? Did you film a lot of in pools, I imagine? How was that for you? Yeah, well, actually, interesting story is um, I don't normally do this because I don't like to spend loads of money on just auditions because you don't know if you're ever going to get the job and whatever. But they were looking for scuba divers. And so I just thought, okay. And the character really, really suited me. Um, So I just thought, okay, 
what are the chances that there's going to be loads of actors with scuba diving tickets, like paddy courses? I thought, maybe not that many. And so they were like, we really want a scuba diver. If not, you have to be a great swimmer. So I was like, I said to my girlfriend, like, look, we haven't got any money right now, but there's a paddy course for 400 quid. Do I go and do it? I'll take it out of my like tax savings account, which I shouldn't have done, but I was like, I could <laughs> take it out of that. And if I get the job, it's a big win. It's a, it's a, a small, you know, it's a small risk and a big win. So I was like, it's only 400 quid. I'll have the course anyway. So I went and got my paddy course and um, the dates that they were meant to film in passed. I think they were meant to start in July and it was August. I thought, ah, well, I got the paddy course. Like if I go to the Caribbean, I'll be able to go scuba diving. Uh, no problem. It's only 400 quid, whatever. And then I got a recall. My agent called me and was like, you're on a very, very short list. So I went to meet the director at Spotlight Studios um, for the audition. And he was like, oh, have you ever been scuba diving before? And I was like, I literally, last weekend, I just passed my paddy course. And he was like, he was like what do you mean? Like, what, what, why? Did, for this? And I was like, well, kind of. Like, I just thought, like, it would give me a better chance if I'd been scuba diving at least. And he was like... Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's a big tick because every actor we've, that's come in, they got their paddy course when they were like 10 years old, when they were on a family holiday. Yeah. So they haven't been for like 10 years or whatever. So you've just done it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I could show you my paddy card if you want. And I was like really proud of it. I've got a paddy card. Um, he was like, no, no, I believe you. Um, so that was a big tick. And then um, they were moving fast anyway. And then they took us all to Malta for a week to do to get our paddy courses. So then I was like, oh, my God, I didn't even need to get it because they were going to get us our paddy course anyway. So everyone, there was five of us. We all got flown to Malta. And it sounds very bougie. It was. Um, <laughs> and uh, we all got our paddy courses. And the, the diving team were saying, well, actually, your character lives you know, in the Caribbean working at this diving school. So you should be the best scuba diver out of all of them. Mm -hmm. So we'll get you your advanced while everyone goes off and does their paddy. And I was like, that's, that's great news. I was like, yeah. that's awesome. So the guys would go off and do the paddy course. And in like, whilst we were diving, we would go off and do like kind of rescue and little different sections of, of the advanced. And I had to do a 30 meter dive and everyone else was doing like 10 meters. So, mm -hmm. you know, I really got a, a great experience and it was like, we, you know, looking back, we had to do that. Like if we got in the water on day one of shooting without doing that, I think it would have been a disaster because mm. we were already scared on day yeah. one. But because we'd done this week intensive of doing like night dives and cave dives and shipwreck dives, we were all fairly comfortable. We, we'd learned how to dive. So it was an amazing process. And it's, again, one of them things where I might get to 18 and go, we really did that. We really <laughs> got a film underwater. Like that is that is crazy. Like that, I still think about it today. That was just mad that we did that. I was curious to know, Jack, what were like the main differences for you in terms of performing underwater? Did you find yourself like acting bigger, you know, in terms of like trying to convey your emotions? Was it sort of overacting, would you say, in that part? Well, it's interesting because uh, in these kind of interviews that we've been having, um, I've, I've, I did hear a few of the other actors say like, you know, you almost had to like overact to, to, mm. to, to kind of, because you, you, we had these masks on, full face masks, so you could only really see the eyes. And I remember watching um, like Tom Hardy in Bane and Dunkirk. Um, and in Dunkirk, he's got a, you know, uh, he's a you know, fighter pilot. And in Bane, he's got this mask on and, and he never overacted. You know, it was all in the eyes. He never did anything crazy. Like he was still acting as he would without a mask. But as long as, as long as you, you know, feel it and you, you kind of, um, you've done the prep. Hopefully, the audience should be able to tell what you're kind of trying to admit in, in, in what you, you know, what you're trying to say through the eyes. So I just tried to trust the process. I was like, trust that you don't need to overact this and and deliver it as you would if you're on on the ground or without a mask. And they should be able to see, you know, that that is kind of the idea. I, I, that's what I thought. And so I tried not to go over and I tried to just stick with the plan of like, you know, they will be able to to, to uh, see what you're trying to portray here. Um, so I, I don't think I did. Um, and um, I, I hope that came across. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it felt like a really grounded performance. I just didn't know if it was something naturally like, oh, mm. they can only see this or you can see your body. Like, I don't know if you yeah. felt like, you know, let's throw my arms about, let's kind of flail, let's kind of, yeah, uh, that's your instinct that's maybe. Yeah, that's the thing. I, that, again, I thought I remember some, you know, producers on set saying like, you can kind of do more hand signals like underwater. And I was like, yeah, I, I get that. But again, I was thinking like, 
you know, we're, we're already, we've already got dialogue. We've got mics in the masks. And so I was like, I don't know if that's going to just overdo it. Like, mm. um, you don't see people in real life being like, we need to go this way. <laughs> you know, and it's like, if we've got mics, we yeah. should be able to hear each other. So I was like, I don't know if we need to do all of that. Um, I don't know if it's going to look a bit too cheesy, you know. So yeah, I tried yeah. not to do that as much, um, even though we were told to do it. <laughs> um, but again, I, I prefer that. I prefer a, a, a more subtle performance. And I think that we should trust the audience that they're not dumb and they they understand, you know. Yeah. Um, I think that's a big, big problem with with acting is like we think the audience is, is stupid so we try and overcomplicate it and it's just like it's, they're not yeah you know? definitely yeah I love like subtleties in films and not kind of mm. hand holding the audience I think that's exactly. like, okay yeah. I love this yeah. kind of film yeah um with uh The Last Breath and Take Cover your other film you do American accents in both mm. how was that obviously in Last Breath you're surrounded by a lot of British actors do you stay in the accent do you go method what's the kind of approach with that um so you know, pe people have said I've got a really good American accent and I've been like working on it for so long. I, I for some reason, don't. And so I, I hear my accent when I watch the film for the first time. I'm going like this. Oh, no. I'm like, oh, no. It's so cringe. Like the last breath when it came out, I was so gutted after. And I said to my girlfriend and her parents, was that all right? Like, was my accent all right? Same as take cover. I just heard myself and I was like, I, I don't like it. But everybody else, including Americans, think that it's fine, that they think it's really good. So because of that fear, uh, on on day one, Alex Arnold, uh, the guy who plays Brett, he was in the accent from day one and he would do it all day. And then when we called rap, then in the evening at the hotel, he would go back to his own accent. And I just said, do you mind if I do that with you? I think I'll be more confident if I latch on someone else mm -hmm. and we're doing it together. And I was like, yeah, sure, man. <laughs> so we would be in it. So I was in it for the whole shoot. And my girlfriend came and, and uh, visited set in uh, in Malta and even on my lunch breaks in the trailer, I'd, I'd be doing the accent in front of her. And she was, I think she was thinking like, you don't need to do it in front of me. But it was for me, like, yeah. I just needed to stay in it so that I knew that I was ready to go. Because you do, you do kind of get out of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And and if you're in your own accent, sometimes it takes a while to, to warm up. And so mm -hmm. it's just trying to keep that like, like rhythm in the, uh, in the jaw. And sometimes your jaw tightens up a little bit and you get, you kind of slip some words. So... For for the last breath, I did. I, I stayed in it. For take cover, I didn't. Some days I'd go in and I'd do the accent, and then you know, in the makeup, I'd be in the accent. And uh, I remember my first day in, on take cover, I was doing the accent in the makeup chair, and the uh, makeup artist was like, "So, uh, where are you from in the states?" And I was like, "No, I'm I'm from up north in England." And she was like, "No way!" And I was like. Now I can stop because I've tricked you. And if I've tricked cool. you, then I'm good. Like I can do the accent. <laughs> so that was like a big boost. So, yeah, I mean, it's good. To, I think it's good staying it, but it's also really tiring. Mm. It's like you hear about these stories about, you know, famous actors staying in the accent the entire time. And it's so draining mentally because you're constantly trying to think of, you know, you, you are constantly thinking about it. You're constantly yeah. thinking about the accent and it is tiring. Like by the end of the day, you're a bit knackered. So it's tough. So that leads us nicely on to Take Cover, your next film, which comes out on Monday, um, which you can rent, download, whatever you want to do, um, and it's out on Apple. So Take Cover is about a burned out professional sniper who finds himself trapped in an apartment and the tables have turned. So Jack, you play Ken in this film. I have to say he's a quick talking, cheeky chappy, who's not only Sam's right hand man, but I'd say he's his friend too in this film. But that dynamic between you two was great on screen. Did you spend a lot of time with Scott Adkins before shooting it to sort of get that relationship going? Yeah, and again, another interesting story, and it kind of it's great to know for younger actors that it it the proof is in the pudding that work does breed work. And mm -hmm. if you do a good job on set and you make friends with people and you network well it does come back around. And so I, w I got cast in a film called One Shot, which was led by Scott Atkins, mm -hmm. Alice Eve and Ryan Philippe. I was part of the SEALs team in that. And me and Scott just really bonded on that. And I wasn't a huge part of that. I was um, in the first 30 pages, but it was kind of the main core group. So I felt like I was one of them, you know, part of the team, but I didn't last the whole film. Um, but me and Scott were just having a great laugh. We had great camaraderie. We were getting on really well. Banter was flying. And that was that. I went off. I went off to do other projects and, you know, that was it. Mm -hmm. Film came out, did really well. We kind of stayed in touch a little bit, but not hugely. And then one night 
and to me, Scott's, you know, Scott Atkins is a big deal. So I, I was like, really kind of put him on a pedestal for me. I was like, this guy's like a famous actor, man. <laughs> and um, one night I was laid in bed with my girlfriend. We were watching a film and uh, me and Scott had swapped, swapped numbers, but we didn't really text too much uh, in between that time. And two years after one shot, I get a call and it's Scott Atkins. And I, I look at Mel and I'm like, <laughs> God, Scott Atkins is calling me. And she's like, answer it then. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. I was like, Hey, hey, it was Scott, mate. And I was trying to be all cool. Like, yeah, hey, hey, pal. <laughs> but I'm like, why is he calling me? And he basically said, look, we've got this movie. We're looking for the second, like, the kind of number two, my my spotter, my right-hand man. We can't find the right guy. And I remembered you from one shot. We got on really well, didn't we, pal? Yeah, yeah, we got on really well. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, that similar character, kind of like kind of happy-go-lucky, brash, kind of loud mouth joker guy. Uh, we're looking for that. And he was like, do you want to audition? I was like, Yes, I'd love to audition. Like that'd be great. So I I send in a, a t- self tape, and him and and Ben Jakes is the producer on one shot. He was also the producer on take cover. So them two were backing me. They were like Ben said, "Oh, what a great idea! Actually, it'd be great for that." So they they convinced the director um, that I was right for the part. And then again, a couple like a month later, I get a call. I've got the job, and I was like, "Oh my god!" So we went in already with that chemistry. We already knew each other. And we already got on. So, and then I said, Scott, I don't know how busy your schedule is, but I'd love to rehearse for this. Like, do you want to rehearse? So I drove to his house in, in it's near Birmingham and we kind of had a few rehearsal days with the director and uh, yeah, it was great. It was really great. So we already went on set knowing each other. I think mm-hmm. that helps a lot. I think that helps a lot if we're already kind of pals, it, you yeah. know, your confidence is already up there and we go in on day one already having that banter in our own life that it was just, it worked. It really did work. Yeah, it definitely came across on screen. I think that kind of dynamic, that's why, you know, I think, you know, your kind of buddy kind of genre film is there between you two characters. And it's great to know that you've had that relationship before. Um, How did you approach the character of Ken? Did you draw from anyone you've met in life? Maybe some (laughs) uh, laddish type of behavior or maybe you had a playlist or something? Um, well, I, at first thing I did was I watched as many sniper films as I possibly could. Mm. And secondly, um, I, I played rugby when I was a young lad. So from the ages of 14 to 21, I played rugby. And they are very, very laddish, um, boisterous group. And there's lots of characters in there, uh, not characters, but actual people that I, I pulled from. Um, there's loads of lads that are trying to prove themselves. There's loads of lads that want to be the funniest in the room. They want to sleep with the most girls. They want to drink the most pints. Like the guys in rugby who can drink a pint the fastest was some weird, weirdly was respected the most. You know, if if some guy could drink a pint, he's the coolest guy in the room. And it was just like, yeah. And as I grew up, I kind of... um, kind of thought that was a bit silly you know as I got into my later 20s I was like that was kind of stupid <laughs> but we had loads of fun doing it so that was and I, and I kind of um watching films and, and documentaries on on the military and stuff it's kind of similar you've got loads of, of boisterous boyish kind of masculine men all fighting war and, and doing physical exercise and all this and there's there's that kind of similar thing going off where people are competing to be the funniest or the joker and ken is definitely that guy Mm -hmm. and i started to journal when i got the job um in the film i don't want to ruin it but ken goes off to amsterdam Mm -hmm. and i remember the director saying yeah ken ken loves going to amsterdam and he loves doing all this and blah blah blah." but i just started to journal every day uh, of what ken would be thinking in amsterdam and then by the end of the journal i was like I actually don't think Ken's that happy. I think because he was trying to convince yeah. Sam to go with him. And I'm like, you know, the guys that try and convince you so bad to go on holiday, like, oh, come on, please come, come. And you're like, if it's that good, mm. just go on your own. Mm-hmm. Like, why do you need me there? I'm like, I actually think he's quite lonely. Yeah. And so I think that his job with Sam, and this is why I'm so annoyed when, uh, when you know, when Sam decides to retire, I think he's, he's, he's really annoyed. He's like, this is my life. This is all I've got. And a lot of military guys are like that. They come home and they feel lost. They don't know where they, they place anymore. You know, that kind of uh, job gives them a purpose in life and they feel like they're um, adding to the, to the society and community and all that. So yeah, I, I kind of based on all that information, like I think Ken's overcompensating for something. I think he's actually quite lonely in his real life. And I think he, you know, and again, I was a class clown as a kid and maybe I was trying to fit in. and I was trying to keep up that status of being the cool guy or whatever. 
And I think that's what Ken does. And uh, he just didn't shake it off in his late late twenties or early thirties. I think he he was still in that mode of like being a bit of a kid. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was uh, my kind of kind of prep on that. And um, again, I hope it came across. Um, I do like Ken. I think he's a cool character. But uh, again, I think deeper, he probably is a little bit lonely, really. Yeah, I've definitely met Ken's in my life or seen them oh, out yeah. on a Saturday night through town. Yeah. And you're like, oh, yeah. OK, I think you just need a hug. Maybe someone yeah, to talk yeah, to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you need a girlfriend and you need to stay in a bit more and uh, yeah. you need to stop being a kid. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Obviously, this is a very action-packed film with a lot of stunts. I know the director, Nick uh, McKinless, uh, yeah. was, has a wealth of experience in terms of doing stunts himself and coordinating um, again, was that something, you know, that kind of experience, is that something you're familiar with? Is that what drew you to the project, getting really involved? Obviously, you said you were with Scott. Was yeah. that kind of a pull for you as well, the stunts? Big time, because I, I love doing stunts and a lot of projects I've done, if I've had to do a bit of a stunt, the stunt guys have always said, oh, you can't, you move well. You, um, you're pretty kind of, you look pretty good on screen doing stunts. And I'm, I'm always going, oh, yeah, maybe I should do stunts one day. Like, oh. And so I've always liked it. And, and look, again, I'm, I'm a bit of a kid. I love playing with guns. Like, this is the thing about acting. It's it's childlike. It's You get to, not often you get to play with guns that actually fire, like, gas. And you're pretending to fire people. And they actually fall when you fire. And it's then someone calls cut. And you're like, I was having fun. Yeah. I was having fun there. Why did we cut? Right. <laughs> um, so the the project, when, when it came through, I was like, one, we've got Scott. One, Ben Jakes, who's the producer I worked with him before. I love him. Um, Nick, I've never met, but again, massive in the stunt world. Worked on Fast and Furious and some huge boats. So I was like, the stunts are going to be good. And I really enjoy it. And I really want to kind of go into a bit more of that. Not necessarily typecast as an action man. You know, I really want to do some serious drama and, and do different bits and stuff and period and all that. But it is so much fun doing that stuff. Like that stuff is is so much fun. So I wanted the experience, and so I, there was a few fight scenes in there with Ken, and I was like, oh, this this could be great for me. You know, this is, could be great for for future projects. And and when you're going up for other action things, a lot of the time they ask for a stunt reel. They're like, mm -hmm. can he fire a gun? Is he military trained? Is he you know can he do a fight scene? And um, so that just massively helps when you've got that in your back pocket. So yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jack, talking about The Last Breath and Take Cover. Um, if people people can watch The Last Breath now, you can watch it on Paramount Plus. That's how I watched it. Or on Apple TV. And Take Cover is out on the 14th of October. Uh, you can get that on Apple and other services as well. So thank you very much for chatting with me today, Jack. Are there any projects you want to shout out that you can talk about that we can keep an eye out for that are yet to come? Um, not yet. From the films, I've had quite a few meetings with directors but they're not quite there yet or they're not 100 percent down or the money's not there yet or they're not filming yet and so there's a few things floating around that i'm not even uh it's not solid yet so yeah. i won't say anything but I'm, I'm quite excited to see what's next yeah. so uh yeah we'll see well, well thank you so much for spending the time talking to me today and i'm sure we're gonna get loads of people watching those two amazing films thank you so much thanks for having me